Hi, welcome to another lesson in Ancient Hellenistic Greek. Today we're going to be looking at contract verbs. In Greek, we're going to find a huge number of verbs that don't seem to quite fit the patterns that you've been learning. If we try to remember all of those odd forms just by brute memorization, it's quickly going to get overwhelming. But in a lot of cases, we don't have to. We can learn to predict when an unusual form is going to show up and when it does, what it's going to look like. It may seem like we're getting into a lot of very obscure details today. Tiny details about how vowels interact. But trust me, if we can learn a few of these details now, it's going to pay off hugely down the road in all kinds of forms that you can easily figure out without really even having to think about it. What is a contract verb in ancient Greek? It's not a verb that signs a legal contract. It's a verb whose stem ends in a short vowel. The short vowels we're concerned about here are epsilon, omicron, and alpha. Take for example, doulao, I am enslaving. Doulao is a contract verb because when we take off the personal ending, the verb stem ends in an omicron, a short vowel. With poleo, I am selling, the verb stem ends in epsilon, so it's a contract verb as well. And the same thing goes for horao, I see, whose stem ends in a short alpha. When you look at the dictionary form of a verb and you take off the omega personal ending, if the last letter of the stem is an alpha, epsilon, or omicron, that's a contract verb. Okay. But why do we call them contract verbs? And why does that short vowel at the end of the stem even matter? Well, when that short stem vowel runs into a connecting vowel at the start of the personal ending, those two vowels are going to make a deal. They do enter a kind of contract together. One might agree to hide, or the two of them are going to join and become a new vowel sound. The two vowels also sometimes contract in the sense that the combined result is shorter. Where two vowels met, only one remains. Or if three vowels met, we might be left with just a two vowel diphthong. If we're not prepared for these vowel changes, the forms of contract verbs are going to seem confusing and totally random. Fortunately, there are predictable patterns about how these vowels combine or collapse together. Short vowels are weaker and more prone to change than long vowels. So let's look first at what happens when two short vowels meet. When the short vowel at the end of the stem meets a short connecting vowel at the beginning of the personal ending, the two usually combine to form a single long vowel or diphthong. Which vowel emerges from this meeting depends on the particular combination. And you can see in this chart how the combinations work. The blue vowel on the left of the chart is the one that comes first. We'll call it the stem vowel, since it comes at the end of the verb stem. The red vowel at the top is the one that comes second. It's the connecting vowel that glues the personal ending onto the verb stem. Where the row for a stem vowel crosses the column for a connecting vowel, we find the new long vowel or diphthong they produce when they meet. In most combinations, the order doesn't matter. When Omicron meets another Omicron, or an Epsilon, the two join to become an omicron upsilon diphthong, making the oo sound. So for example, the stem of the verb dulao ends in a short Omicron. When we add the second person plural personal ending, we use an Epsilon connecting vowel, eta. We might expect that the resulting form would be dula eta, but the short omicron and that short epsilon combine to form the u diphthong. So the actual form we see is duluta, you are enslaving. Something similar happens in the first person plural. When an omicron meets another omicron, they also become an u diphthong. Our stem dula still ends in an omicron, and now the first person plural personal ending is attached with another omicron, omen. When the two omicrons meet, they become u. So we have the first person plural form, dulumen, we are enslaving. 
if instead we have an alpha running up against an omicron, whatever their order, they become a long ovel omega. The verb horao has a stem that ends in a short alpha. The first person plural ending is once again attached with an omicron. So this time the alpha and omicron contract together to form a single omega and we have the form horomen, we see. The combinations involving epsilon stem vowels are only slightly trickier. When an epsilon meets another epsilon, they combine to form the diphthong epsilon iota, or a. If I want to say you are selling, I might use the second person plural form of the verb poleo. That stem, pole, ends again in that short epsilon, and the second person plural ending, eta, will also attach with an epsilon. So the two contract, and we have the form poleta, you, plural, are selling. When an epsilon and an alpha meet, we suddenly find that the order of the two short vowels matters. If the epsilon comes first, it gets the upper hand in the contract. So the pair will merge and become a long E-class vowel, that is an eta. But if the alpha comes first, if the alpha is the stem vowel, and then it meets an epsilon at the beginning of the ending, the result of the merger will simply be an alpha. It's fairly easy to remember that whichever vowel comes first, epsilon or alpha, determines the class of the merged vowel. E-class if epsilon is first, A-class if the alpha comes first. But why is the A-class vowel that results here just an alpha? Why doesn't the combination of alpha and eta produce a long A vowel just like the long eta? Well, the answer is that alpha is one of those few Greek vowels that can be long or short. It's best to think of the short alpha stem vowel combining with the epsilon connector and becoming a single long alpha. We don't pronounce long alpha as a different sound, but it was probably held slightly longer when it was pronounced in antiquity. In any case, that explains why when the alpha comes first and meets an epsilon, that A-class vowel that results is just another alpha. So if I want to say U, plural, C, I take the stem hora, attach the ending eta, and the result is horata. We won't actually run into the alpha-alpha combination until later on, but there too, the short vowels combine to form one long alpha. It may seem like a lot of work up front to memorize these rules of vowel combination, but trust me, as we get further on, this is going to get to the point where it just seems second nature. You'll automatically recognize when two vowels are going to combine and it'll become instinctive what those combinations are going to produce. And if you can remember these things now, again, you're not going to have to memorize tons and tons of unusual forms. You're gonna recognize them as soon as they show up. What about when a short stem vowel doesn't run into another short vowel at the beginning of the personal ending? Instead, it meets a long vowel or a diphthong. We need a second chart to capture these combinations, but they also follow a few rules. First, a long vowel like omega will just absorb a short stem vowel. The omega just swallows it up. Take, for example, the first person singular form of horao. The stem hora ends in a short alpha, and we add the omega ending. But when those two vowels run up against one another, the long omega overpowers the short alpha and absorbs it, like a microorganism eating its prey. The actual form that results then is not horao, but horo, I am seeing. In the same way, if I want to say I am selling, I start with the stem pole, and then add the first person singular ending o, omega. Remember that the connecting vowel has already combined with the original personal ending to produce this single omega. So now, when the epsilon stem runs up against the omega ending, that short vowel disappears. Instead of poleo, the actual first person singular form we'll see is polo, 
I am selling. Likewise, when I add the omega ending onto the stem du la, the short omicron of the stem is absorbed, and we end up with the form du lo, I am enslaving. But what about when the short stem vowel doesn't run into a short vowel or a single long vowel at the start of the personal ending? Instead, it meets a diphthong. You have two choices here. One, you can just memorize the other six boxes in this chart. But you can also remember a few rules that explain why this chart looks like it does. One of those rules is that like short vowels collapse together. If the short stem vowel is the same as the short vowel that starts a diphthong, the two just collapse together and become a single short vowel of the same kind. The other vowel of the diphthong remains. For example, maybe I want to translate the English tongue twister, she sells seashells by the seashore. So I want to say she sells in Greek. I'll take the verb pole and add the third person singular ending epsilon iota, the diphthong a. But the result won't be pole a. When the two epsilons meet, since they're the same short vowel, they collapse together and become just a single epsilon. The iota of the original diphthong remains. So the final form is just pole, she sells. Notice that this isn't the same thing that happened in the last chart when two epsilons met. That was because in that case, we were dealing with epsilons that were both on their own. Here, the second epsilon is part of a diphthong, so it behaves differently. What we're looking at is what happens when epsilon meets the epsilon iota diphthong. But in that meeting of the three vowels, if the first two are the same, they collapse together. Now, maybe I want to talk about the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans in 70 CE, when a whole lot of war captives were made slaves. I might want to say, they are enslaving. Then I'll start with the stem du la and add the third person plural ending, usi. The omicron stem vowel and the omicron in the diphthong that follows are the same. So again, they just collapse together. We get the form du lusi, they are enslaving. Maybe the Romans have brought their Jewish prisoners back to the imperial slave markets. In that case, I want to say they are selling the captives as slaves. So I'll make use of the stem pole and add the third person plural ending now, usi. This time though, the short stem vowel epsilon isn't meeting another epsilon at the beginning of the diphthong, so they can't collapse together. Instead, when the first two vowels in this kind of meeting are different, then they just contract, following the same chart we saw before. There we learned that epsilon and omicron contract to form the u diphthong, omicron upsilon. The same thing happens here, and we get the vowel combination omicron upsilon upsilon. But before we just write that down, we have to remember that Greek rarely, if ever, allows two long vowels to stand side by side. So the second upsilon is dropped, and we just have omicron upsilon, or u. That means the form is polusi, they are selling. The same rule comes into play if I want to say that the Jewish captives see their Roman oppressors. I might begin with the stem hora and add the third person plural personal ending. Once again, the alpha stem vowel is different from the omicron at the beginning of the following diphthong. So the two contract to form an omega, following the pattern from our first chart. This leaves us with an omega upsilon combination, but once more, Greek doesn't like having two long vowels side by side. So the upsilon is dropped. We end up with the form horosi, they see. But if there's only one captive who sees the buyers in the slave market, I would instead add the third person singular ending, a, epsilon iota. Now it's an alpha stem vowel meeting the epsilon of the a diphthong. The two vowels are different, so they contract and form one long alpha. Remember the alpha came first, so it dominated. 
Since iota can be long or short, it doesn't have to drop off the way the upsilons dropped off in the last couple of forms, but it almost does. It shortens so much that it slides under the long alpha and becomes an iota subscript. It's still written, and it's a necessary part of the word spelling, but the iota is no longer pronounced. The final form is hora, he sees. So this second chart isn't too difficult to remember. A long omega will just absorb short stem vowels. When a diphthong is involved, look at the stem vowel and the first vowel of that diphthong. Like vowels will just collapse together, while different vowels will contract. Then you may need to deal with the remaining long vowel at the end of the diphthong, either by dropping an upsilon or by reducing the iota to a subscript. If you find the rules helpful, that's great. If you find it simpler just to memorize the chart, that's perfectly fine too. If you are learning the rules though, just note that there's one exception to them, of course. When an omicron meets the epsilon iota diphthong, A, the result is the new diphthong, OI, omicron iota. This is not what we'd expect, but it means that if we add the third person singular ending onto the stem du la, the resulting form will be du loi, she is enslaving. There's one other trick with contract verbs that's easy to miss. I actually was well into learning Greek before I clued into it. The dictionary form for these verbs, that's the form that you'll find at the start of a lexicon entry, or the form that you'll find at the beginning in a vocabulary list, that dictionary form is artificial. With other kinds of verbs, the dictionary form is the actual first person singular present tense form, but not with contract verbs. We talk about the verb dulao, but that form is never actually used in ancient Greek. The actual first person singular present active indicative is dulo. Actually, that's what we would expect based on the rules that we just learned. Why do we learn the artificial form then? So that we remember that the final stem vowel is there, so that we can take it into account when we're using the verb. The same thing happens with poleo and horao. The actual first person singular forms are polo and horo. But by learning these artificial dictionary forms, we're encouraged to remember that the short epsilon or alpha at the end of the stem is going to combine with connecting vowels. So now you have two charts, 18 forms in total, 18 combinations of vowels to remember. And if you can just remember those two charts, that's going to stand you in such good stead in the future, not just with dealing with contract verbs, but also dealing with the third declension noun forms that we've already seen and all kinds of other forms as we move forward. If you want to learn more about contract verbs or read another explanation of the patterns, check out the chapter in Basics of Biblical Greek by William Mounts. Thanks for watching. I'm Ian Scott and I'm Associate Professor of New Testament Studies at Tyndale Seminary. This video was produced as part of my web app called Paideia an interactive space for learning the Hellenistic Greek of the New Testament and other early Jewish and Christian writings, as well as the whole Hellenistic world. If you haven't tried out Paideia, you can find the app at learngreek.ca slash Paideia. You can find the whole playlist of my Greek videos by clicking the link here. And if you appreciate free learning resources like this, don't forget to click the like button below and subscribe to my channel.